Let's start with Daisy Miller. So Daisy Miller, I called it a novella. And what that basically means, because it's a category between a short story and a novel. So imagine a novel, it's much bigger, it's more expansive, it's a more expansive narrative. Short stories, by contrast, often feel much smaller and localized, perhaps around a particular event or moment in time. But the novella, and it's not always easy to define what a novella is, what a short story is, what a novel is. All of these definitions are quite fluid, but you can imagine that Daisy Miller fits perhaps somewhere in between those two. It's certainly longer than we would expect and more expansive than a short story, but it would probably need a little more for us to describe it as a novel. And this is not necessarily important to uh, our conversation about the story, Daisy Miller, but it is something that I like to just say and identify for my students when thinking about how different modes of writing, the novel, the short story, the poem, etc., establishes or creates certain expectations. But something else that might help to establish a set of expectations, especially about some of the themes, the important themes of the story, is this illustration that appeared on the front piece to the 1892 edition. And this appears in your book on page 411. And I think obviously the most striking image from this front piece is this sense that this female character who I believe we're of course led to assume is Daisy, she's quite trapped by these bindings. And that in many ways is a perfect visual encapsulation of this story because one of the main themes that Miller certainly wants to dramatize is what it means to be a woman in the modern world. And again, we can think about that term or that phrase, the modern world, in a fluid and dynamic way because it's quite difficult to know exactly how and to what degree the modern world of Miller's time accurately reflects the modern world as we understand it in the 21st century, but there are certain similarities that I certainly want to discuss. But something that I always like to bring to the attention of my students is just how, sure, Daisy, this, this again, this image from this front piece is such a wonderful representation of the life Daisy lives or the sorts of constraints that she feels, but what exactly does Daisy do to antagonize those constraints? How does she attempt to fight against them? And what are the consequences of that fight, that quite important fight to assert herself and to assert her agency in a modern world that doesn't seem to want her to do that. And I think that's an idea that we see in Edith Wharton's work, in particular, the two stories I asked you to read for today. So if we're thinking, what are one of the, or what is one of the overarching themes, ideas, or notions that really tethers all of the reading for this week together. It's precisely that. How do female characters like Daisy Miller attempt to assert themselves despite the constraints that the world, society, etc. places upon them? And what are the consequences of asserting oneself the way Daisy does, and how do characters in Edith Wharton stories, again, attempt to do something similar, but their methods are different. And again, what are the outcomes or the consequences of, again, attempting to do the same thing, but doing it differently? So a few additional themes for this novella that I want to here at the beginning bring to your attention, and I'll return to them throughout this lecture, this old versus new world dichotomy or Europe versus America, because what the Miller family and Daisy in particular represents is this new class of individuals 
who now have, for lack of a better phrase, a place at the table with these older, more established individuals who uh, have their place at the table, so to speak, because of inherited wealth. And that is very much what figures like Mrs. Costello, Mrs. Walker, and Winterbourne represent, this aristocracy that has power and influence and money and exclusivity because of this line of inheritance. And that's very much not what the Millers are. They're what is called the nouveau riche or the new rich. And they're newly rich because of their successes during the industrial revolution. So there is this antagonism between this older, established aristocracy, again, represented by figures like Mrs. Costello, Mrs. Walker, Winterbourne, etc., and this new class, this nouveau riche class. And the point, I suppose, is, well, what happens when those two classes are forced to interact with one another? What sorts of rules and normative practices does a figure like Daisy Miller antagonize, reject, and what's the reaction to that? And again, this is very much a story about the world changing in front of figures like Mrs. Costello, Mrs. Walker, and Winterbourne. And as you can see from reading the story, their reaction to those changes are... They're not hospitable, I suppose. They are quite antagonistic to the idea that the world as they understand it and the rules and the privileges that they derive from those rules, they're quite antagonistic to the notion that any of that needs to change. And I think this is something we see repeatedly, not just in American history, but in in world history, in human history, this sense that those who are in established positions and experience certain privileges because of their established, entrenched positions, they're quite antagonistic to the idea of, of perhaps expanding that privilege, or, or if they want to expand that privilege in those opportunities, they want to do so with a particular set of rules in place. And because of this, figures like Mrs. Costello, Mrs. Walker, and Winterbourne seem quite conservative. They want to hew much closer to tradition. And I suppose as readers, the question James wants us to consider or the question he wants us to entertain is, well, should the world change? What are the... are our, are the concerns of figures like Mrs. Costello and Mrs. Walker, are they legitimate concerns or are they more than anything just the reflection of a class of individuals who are afraid if the world changes, their privilege within that world will wane, which is to say they will not have the same kind of privilege and authority they once had. And again, while the particulars might change, I think this is very much a dynamic that's present in our current contemporary moment. So in that way, much like the Walt Whitman poem from last week, even though the particulars of this story might seem quite antiquated, I think the overarching idea or the overarching notion that James grapples with, it's, it's omnipresent, it's, it's with us at all times. But before I actually talk about some of the particulars of the story, I would encourage you to just think about the names of our two main characters, because this is very much a story with, I suppose, a protagonist in a figure like Winterbourne, but the story is still very much about Daisy Miller. And again, I call Winterbourne the protagonist, and that is that is something of a precarious thing to say because he's he's not a hero under any circumstances, but it's important to remember that 
protagonists are not always heroes, but he is very much the main character, and Daisy is is perhaps the main focus of the narrative. Winterborn, more than anything, is a vehicle to Daisy Miller to to help us as readers better understand this character, even as at the end of the story, I think you might agree, we still don't really know that much about Daisy Miller. She's still very much an enigma, but just looking at their names, I think is important because I think James does a lot of the work of establishing expectations for us just by how he's named these characters. And I'll start with Daisy Miller. Daisy Miller that word Miller, it is a reflection of perhaps working class sensibilities or just the sensibilities of someone who works. It doesn't feel nearly as aristocratic as something like Winterborn. Her last name is a reflection of or a projection of a kind of work, a job, a profession, etc. Whereas with someone like Winterborn, his name sounds very aristocratic, winter born, but also this emphasis, and if you just wanted to read it quite literally, on winter and birth, this idea that he is perhaps a cold and distant character, and we see that repeatedly throughout the story, and I suspect there are many other ways to read or interpret his name, and I would encourage you to think about those and indulge in those, but just paying attention to names and how they might communicate important pieces of information about particular characters. But why don't we actually start on pages 412 and 413. And I want us to focus in particular on how James characterizes Daisy at the beginning of this story and how our understanding of Daisy, it's it's filtered through not any particular thing she says, although what she says matters, but just what Winterborn observes about her, the way she just exists in the world, the way she moves through this world. And I'll start here on page 413. The young lady, meanwhile, had drawn near. She was dressed in white muslin with a hundred frills and flounces and knots of pale-colored ribbon. She was bareheaded, but she balanced in her hand a large parasol with a deep border of embroidery, and she was strikingly, admirably pretty. How pretty they are, thought Winterborn, straightening himself in his seat as if he were prepared to rise. The young lady paused in front of his bench near the parapet of the garden which overlooked the lake. The little boy had now converted his alpenstock into a vaulting pole by the aid of which he was springing about in the gravel and kicking it up not a little. Randolph, said the young lady, what are you doing? I'm going up to the Alps, replied Randolph. This is the way. And he gave another little jump, scattering the pebbles about Winterborn's ears. That's the way they come down, said Winterborn. He's an American man, cried Randolph in his little hard voice. The young lady gave no heed to this announcement, but looked straight at her brother. Well, I guess you had better be quiet she simply observed. It seemed to Winterborn that he had been in a manner presented. He got up and stepped slowly towards the young girl, throwing away his cigarettes. This little boy and I have made acquaintance, he said, with great civility. In Geneva, as he had been perfectly aware, a young man was not at liberty to speak to a young, unmarried lady except under certain rarely occurring conditions. But here at Vevey, what conditions could be better than these? A pretty American girl coming and standing in front of you in a garden. This pretty American girl, however, on hearing Winterborn's observation, simply glanced at him. She then turned her head and looked over the parapet at the lake and the opposite mountains. He wondered whether he had gone too far, but he decided that he must advance farther rather than retreat. While he was thinking of something else to say, the young lady turned to the little boy again. So a couple of things here. First, notice how Daisy's clothing, it certainly seems to communicate a kind of purity and virginity, but almost immediately 
Winterborn comes to the conclusion or the realization that perhaps the clothing she wears doesn't fully encapsulate what he thought she would be and what she what he expected her to be. Because what's quite striking here is just how dismissive Daisy seems of him. She doesn't seem to care at all. You'll notice the young lady, quote, gave no heed to this announcement, which is to say she doesn't seem terribly interested in Winterborn. She's being a bit dismissive of him. And ironically enough, or surprisingly enough, that seems to only pique his interest more, the sense that this young woman, this unnamed woman, cares so little about him. She seems to have other interests, other concerns, other preoccupations. But what I would also encourage you to notice is just how disruptive Daisy and, by extension, her brother, Randolph, are. This is, and you may have noticed this as you read the opening paragraphs, there's something quite calm, peaceful, serene, orderly about the opening of this story, but almost immediately, Randolph disrupts it. He is very much, he, and again, by extension, Daisy and her family, they function as disruptions in this space. But for someone like Winterborn, it's a disruption that he at least wants to entertain for a while. And I think this is important because a figure like Winterborn, even though by the end of the story, by the end of the novella, he's clearly made his decision about where his allegiances lie, so much of this story is about Winterborn not necessarily knowing where he will align, which is to say, will he will he retreat back into these old world aristocratic sensibilities, again, the sorts of sensibilities exhibited by or or reflected through characters like Mrs. Costello, or will he embrace this new world and perhaps all of the delightful uncertainty associated with it, the kind of new world sensibilities in politics that a figure like Daisy Miller represents. And again, we know ultimately the decision he makes, he rejects Daisy Miller, he rejects perhaps the ideas, the ideals, the sensibilities, the politics that she reflects. But for most of this story, it, it doesn't seem that clear. We're not entirely sure what he'll do. And I think here we're starting to see perhaps what's so enticing about the modernity or the modern sensibilities that Daisy embodies. But later in this section, Daisy actually expresses herself. And this is on page 416 near the bottom. Here she's speaking to Winterborn, and she says, quote, The only thing I don't like, she proceeded, is the society. There isn't any society, or if there is, I don't know where it keeps itself. Do you? I suppose there is some society somewhere, but I haven't seen anything of it. I'm very fond of society, and I have always had a great deal of it. I don't mean only in Synecdoche, but in New York. I used to go to New York every winter. In New York, I had lots of society. Last winter, I had 17 dinners given me, and three of them were by gentlemen, added Daisy Miller. I have more friends in New York than in Synecdoche, more gentlemen friends, and more young lady friends, too. She resumed in a moment. She paused again for an instant. She was looking at Winterborn with all her prettiness in her lively eyes and in her light, slightly monotonous smile. I have always had, she said, a great deal of gentleman's society. Poor Winterborn was amused, perplexed, and decidedly charmed. He had never yet heard a young girl express herself in just this fashion, never at least save in cases where to say such things seemed a kind of demonstrative evidence of a certain laxity of deportment. And I'll stop there for just a moment because what, and James's language at times is a bit difficult, but you could almost imagine that there's something satirical, perhaps even ironic to uh, a contemporary reader because 
this language a kind of demonstrative evidence of a certain laxity of deportment. This feels more than anything like how Winterborn, the sort of language he uses to process the world, because what Winterborn ostensibly feels and what James attempts to communicate is, well, he's never met a young girl this honest and this forthright with her feelings. And I think that's what's so, this is something we see consistently throughout the story. Daisy does this rather odd thing. She just says what she feels to anyone and everyone. And while that may not seem so radical to us today, I think it is still to some degree quite radical the way she sees and understands the rules of society, the rules that govern society, yet she could not care less. And I think in that way, Daisy is very much a radical figure because she wants to, and maybe, and I think this is important as well, there's no evidence that Daisy does this actively because she wants to change the world. Maybe she does, but we don't actually get this story from Daisy's perspective. I think that's important too. So it is it is at no moment does it at no moment does Daisy ever say to us, I do this for these reasons. And even if she does, I don't know if that's something we could trust. But her intentions, I would argue, are irrelevant, which is to say they're not that important because what matters is what she does. She actively antagonizes the world as she sees it because she finds the world quite intrusive. She finds in particular this European social order quite cumbersome. It's it's restrictive. It has these rules that not only does she not like, but she also just seems to think are quite silly. But for a character like Winterborn, part of, part of the problem, I would argue, with a character like Winterborn, and I think we see this with the opening line to the final paragraph on 416, Winterborn was, quote, amused, perplexed, and decidedly charmed. I think, regrettably too often throughout this story, Daisy is nothing more than a plaything for a character like Winterborn, he objectifies her, which is to say he doesn't always think of her as a person. She's just a thing to interact with. And that's part of what's so unlikable about Winterborn, because he has many unlikable traits and many unlikable characteristics. But there is perhaps this sense, I mentioned this a moment ago, that Winterborn is in the middle of this fight or this larger battle between this old aristocratic sensibility and this newer, more modern sensibility. And this is perhaps one of the moments where James foreshadows what will ultimately happen because Daisy is not, regrettably it seems, someone or something that he takes too terribly seriously. She's just a lark, something to amuse him, something to entertain him. And in that way, he's, again, objectifying her. He's perhaps not seeing her for what she is. And that is also a dynamic. Again, that's reflected in just the way the story's told, the way James tells the story. Daisy is always at a distance, not just from Winterborn, but unfortunately from us as well as readers. And it may encourage us to think or consider, what if Winterborn had just taken her seriously as a person? What if he had thought of her as more than just this amusing, perplexing, charming thing, would we have a better understanding of Daisy Miller? Would we have a better understanding of her motivations? But again, maybe that's not the point. Maybe for someone like James, it's not about why she does it, but what she does matters so much more. I mentioned a couple of times how Mrs. Costello, she's a much older character, but she's old, not just in age, but 
in thoughts, ideas, and sensibilities. She very much reflects this aristocratic order, and Daisy just categorically rejects all of this. Notice, for example, on page 427. This is around the middle of the page. But he saw that she cared very little for feudal antiquities and that the dusky traditions of Kilon made but a slight impression upon her. They had the good fortune to have been able to walk about without other companionship than that of the custodian in Winterborn arranged for this functionary that they should not be hurried, that they should linger and pause wherever they choose. The custodian interpreted the bargain generously. Winterborn, on his side, had been generous and ended by leaving them quite to themselves. Miss Miller's observations were not remarkable for logical consistency. For anything she wanted to say, she was sure to find a pretext. She found a great many pretexts in the rugged embrasures of Kilon for asking Winterborn sudden questions about himself, his family, his previous history, his tastes, his habits, his intentions, and for supplying information upon corresponding points in her own personality. Of her own tastes, habits, and intentions, Miss Miller was prepared to give the most definite and indeed the most favorable account. So, and just to describe the scene, Winterborn, he wanted to uh, take her to this castle. The I believe it's the castle of Kilon. And the first thing that I read, I would argue, is extremely important. But he saw that she cared very little for feudal antiquities. And... This is perhaps important because, again, if we just wanted to simplify this language, what does it ultimately mean? I think the larger point James wants us to consider is, well, she just didn't care for this old place and all of the old trinkets or old items in it. That mattered so little, and it matters so little to her. The past traditions, they mean nothing to Daisy Miller. But what does seem to matter, and we see this near the end of the paragraph, and it's something that Winterborn is so poorly equipped to provide, just genuine information about himself. He seems quite confused and surprised by this. He even calls it a kind of pretense that she'll, she'll find any way to weasel a conversation about his likes and dislikes, who he is as a person. And I think, again, this is significant because for someone like Winterborn, that is just not something one does. And the way he frames it as a pretense, she would find a pretense just to ask him questions. And just thinking about what we, again, in the 21st century value with relationships it's, it's answers to those kinds of questions, and it's those kinds of conversations. But for someone like Winterborn, that's just not something one does. But again, this is another moment where we see Daisy quite literally, but perhaps more importantly, figuratively rejecting the past and rejecting the attitudes and the ideals the past represents. And if we continue through the story, we see... So many of these dynamics between this old aristocratic idea and this new, more modern idea, again, of the world and how it should work as reflected by Daisy Miller, reaching a kind of zenith or, or, or that, that antagonism, that fight between those two, it's, it's, starting to, it's starting to peak and it's starting to crescendo in, in particular, parts three and four. And... We have this moment on page 434, for example, when Daisy certainly asserts herself and asserts her independence in a far more forceful way, maybe something we haven't heard to this point in the story. And this is on page 434. I don't like the way you say that, said Daisy. It's too imperious. I beg your pardon if I say it wrong. The main point is to give you an idea of my meaning. The young girl looked at him more gravely, but with eyes that were prettier than ever. I have never allowed a gentleman to dictate to me or to interfere with anything I do. I think you have made a mistake, said Winterborn. You should sometimes listen to a gentleman, the right one. Daisy began to laugh again. 
I do nothing but listen to gentlemen, she exclaimed. Tell me if Mr. Giovanelli is the right one. And again, just to set the stage or establish what's happening in the narrative. So there's the introduction or James introduces this third person, this third man, Mr. Giovanelli, who's functioning as a kind of suitor or a potential romantic interest for Daisy Miller. And once again, I would encourage you to think about him in complete and direct contrast to a figure like Winterborn, even his name, Giovanelli. It sounds more lively. It has a kind of vibrance to it that Winterborn simply does not. And he obviously doesn't like Mr. Giovanelli, but part of what he also doesn't like is just how Daisy and Giovanelli interact with one another. It's this breaching of social norms. It's this breaching of sexual mores. And Daisy this is important because, again, this is yet another moment where Daisy says exactly what she thinks. She does not let men dictate to her what she should do. And humorously, and I think this, this bit of humor is representative of just the kind of humor we often see in Daisy Miller because she is an incredibly funny character. I do nothing but listen to gentlemen with an exclamation point. But what we see in this dynamic between Winterborn, Daisy, and Giovanelli, again, is yet another staging ground for this larger conflict between the old and the new. And while Winterborn is utterly scandalized by this, it's perhaps important to ask why. Is it because, whether he knows it or not at this point, he hews much closer to these older, more established ideas, sensibilities, politics, etc. Well, I'm sure that's part of it. But I think, regrettably, another part of it is that he wants something particular from Daisy. And he wants her to be something quite particular. He wants her to be an object. He wants her to be something that he can control, possess, and... Daisy just fundamentally rejects that notion. And this is something that a figure like Winterborn simply doesn't know what to do with. What will the world look like for him if not just Daisy Miller, but all women can assert themselves like this? What will it mean for his place in the world? I think yet again, this is another moment where we're seeing through this conflict between these two characters. Conflicts between larger ideas about how the world should work, how society should work, but also this revelation of what Winterborn ultimately is. This is perhaps another bit of foreshadowing for the end of the story that Winterborn, he's not this modern man in the way that Daisy is a modern woman. He is far more a figure that represents the past and the ideas and the sensibilities of the past. And as we transition into part four, we learn that Daisy has become quite ill. And this notion of contracting a Roman fever or malaria. One of the potential explanations for this was, well, Daisy stayed out late with Mr. Giovanelli, which is precisely why she contracted malaria. And I think you can certainly see how that is not necessarily a scientific or medical determination. It's, it's connected to and tethered to some of these notions about how young women should act and behave. Good, sensible young women who uh, listen to their elders, who hew much closer to tradition. They're safe. They're protected. Whereas these 
modern promiscuous girls like Daisy Miller, they put themselves in these positions. So again, even the interpretation of how Daisy contracted malaria, it's it's a reflection of the politics and the sensibilities that define this older class, this older generation, this aristocracy. But I think the final thing I'll say about Daisy Miller is perhaps why should we why should we like Daisy Miller as a character and why should we celebrate her? Well, I think there are some obvious reasons that I've described in this lecture, but the final one is this sense that she takes an idea to an extreme, even if it means she's created the potential for self-destruction and self-annihilation. Because I think often, in literature in particular, the characters that we celebrate the most and the characters that we admire the most are the ones who uh, are not always too sensible. They go places that we would never go. Perhaps at times quite literally, but often intellectually, philosophically, etc. And that's exactly what Daisy does. And I have a couple of examples just to further illustrate this point. If you've ever read the play Oedipus the King by Sophocles, Oedipus is very much a figure who takes an idea or takes a notion to an extreme and it produces certain self destruction or or the possibility of self-destruction and self-annihilation is all but certain if he goes to the kinds of extremes that he goes and he does it and he does it anyway and perhaps that's one of the things that people and readers really like about that play is is that Oedipus doesn't relent at all he just goes places that other characters will not go he doesn't take that step back. He doesn't moderate at all. And there's a 2010 film starring Natalie Portman called Black Swan. I would encourage you to watch it. It's a very good movie. But that is also a movie. That's also a story about a character who uh, takes an idea to an extreme. And by doing this... She's able to produce art in the most beautiful and remarkable way possible. But again, like Oedipus, like Daisy, it ensures certain annihilation, self-annihilation. In Oedipus, if you haven't read the play, he does this to learn the truth. In Black Swan... Natalie Portman's character, Nina, does it to produce art. And in Daisy Miller, Daisy does it, it seems, for political reasons. Perhaps that's one way to read it. That she wants to reject the past, and she wants to reject the older, more antiquated notions that define the past and that actively restrict her as an individual and all of her all of her pushing all of her antagonism towards those ideas in James's hands leads to her death and in that way Daisy Miller feels very much like a tragedy in the same way that Oedipus the King and Black Swan feel like tragedies but I think that's perhaps why we should celebrate characters like Daisy Miller, because she's prepared to go places that so many characters are not and will not. And the final thing I'll say is, is about or regarding Winterborn, because the way I've talked about him as a character is to imagine that he's very much positioned between these two worlds, this older world defined by these aristocratic traditions and this newer world, this modern world that Daisy defines and represents. And 
I've mentioned how it it seems clear at the end that he doesn't embrace Daisy and he doesn't embrace the ideas and the politics and the sensibilities that she represents and that he retreats back into this older, more aristocratic sensibility. But he can't just forget Daisy Miller and he cannot forget the effect she's had on his life. And part of what I've always found quite confusing about the end of this story is, well, what are we left to think about Winterborn? Because he seemed to reject Daisy, right? But he also doesn't seem to have a place any longer in this older aristocratic world. So where is he? And I think in that way, Winterborn feels like a character who uh, doesn't really have a place in the world now. Because unlike Mrs. Costello, who uh, it seems as if learned nothing from Daisy Miller, she's still quite comfortable. She's still quite secure in this older aristocratic world and society. But Winterborn is not the same. There's what's called cognitive dissonance here, where for him to be safe and secure in Mrs. Costello's world, he would need to almost trick himself into thinking Daisy Miller never existed or he learned nothing from her. But he can't really do that. And in that way, Winterborn seems out of place. And... You might disagree with that conclusion, and I would love to hear about it if you do, but I'll just leave you to think about that a bit. What's Winterborn's place now? Which world does he occupy? And do we even think he, he has a place any longer? He seemed to have a place before, but I wonder if he still has that place now. <laughs>